secrets lay Fill the rest with rocks Let it sink in the bay Down it goes where nobody knows No, she won't have to be Afraid Hello everyone, I am Bob Lingle of Off the Beaten Path Bookstore in Lakewood, New York. I'm here tonight with Sarah Berman. Sarah is the author of Don't Call It a Cult, the shocking story of Keith Raniere and the woman of Nexium. Um, Sarah is an investigative journalist based in Vancouver covering crime, drugs, cults, politics, and culture. Thanks for joining us tonight, Sarah. Thanks for having me. Great to be here. And I just wanted to thank um, Anthony from Steerforth Press for helping get this event set up and everyone watching here tonight. Um, so most people that are going to be watching tonight have a sense of what Nexium is, who Keith Raniere is. But for those who are just innocently scrolling through Facebook and <laughs> happen to stumble upon this conversation, I apologize, <laughs> um, but we, um, can you give an, like an elevator pitch, um, a recap of who Keith Raniere is and who Nexium is? Sure, totally. So a lot of the public understanding of this uh, story comes from this New York Times article that talked about a secret group of women recruiting women slaves and initiating them uh, with a brand, like literally searing their skin near their bikini line um, so that was pretty eye popping. Um, but that is just sort of the end point, I would say, or, you know, one iteration of the story. It actually spans back, you know, 20 years uh, of this company that sort of sold uh, self-help seminars and uh, really cultivated this mythology around its leader, Keith Raniere, uh, this man from the outskirts of Albany. He um, was praised every year uh, the week of his birthday at something called Vanguard Week. Um, and you had all these sort of outrageous claims about him. Like he had an IQ of 240 um, and he apparently, you know, learned to spell homogenized as a toddler just from reading the side of a milk carton. Sort of all these extravagant, unprovable claims about his genius, philosopher, athlete, background, and concert pianist, can't forget that. Um, so when you peel back the layers of it, though, you, you do start to understand that this was a group that was about power and control. Uh, so a lot of experts certainly say it ticks all the boxes in terms of what a cult is, but it was also a multi-level marketing enterprise and prosecutors said basically a mafia-like organization. And so finally in 2019, Keith Raniere himself was convicted of sex trafficking um, involving that sort of branding and blackmail scheme I described earlier uh, and, and a host of other sort of racketeering crimes. Um, so he was charged as if he was a mafia boss. Uh, hope that covers <laughs> at <laughs> least the elevator pitch. That is a great recap. Um, and you had covered the story a lot through your position at Vice. How did you first get involved in investigating this, this story? Yeah, so I mean, I had known about Nexium years previously. Like I had friends of friends who had taken these classes. I had no idea about this secret blackmail scheme. It was just considered bizarro landmark. That's how my friends had described it to me in 2012. Um, landmark being another sort of leadership seminar training, um, usually you know on the weekends, um, and was really also intertwined with Lululemon, uh, which is a local company here in Vancouver. Little did I know Nexium was trying to uh, steal Lululemon as a client back in the day. Um, but I learned about the branding the same way that a lot of people did in the New York Times. And then that's when I started to realize this was so connected to sort of my social circle and, and my generation even of people in Vancouver. So these are, you know, bike riding feminist women, you know, in their 20s and 30s 
who had been taking these classes. And so that got me really wanting to solve like why and how these these folks who seem so familiar to me got involved. Um, so it really was just digging through Facebook, realizing how many contacts I had in common with Sarah Edmondson, getting to meet her, getting to realize, you know, she lives 15 minutes away from me and went to yoga, you know, 15 minutes down the road. Um, just uh, trying to piece together how those two worlds sort of met um, because it seemed so unbelievable from the start. And your book, um, there's obviously a lot like many of you probably have watched The Vow um, on HBO or Seduced on um, Stars. Your book goes into so much more detail and like the, the rise of Keith, um, but also um, Sarah Edmondson is kind of been like not the first whistleblower, but possibly the, the loudest whistleblower, the, mo the most effective. Um, what was your interaction with her? Um, a part of the book you talked about, she kind of literally walked you through how someone might be um, coaxed into, into joining Nexium. Um, talk about that, that experience. Yeah, so Sarah really was my starting point, and I think she's the starting point for, yeah, a lot of these documentary properties. Um, and so when I first met her, I couldn't understand what she was telling me. Like it didn't make sense. I really had to, you know, stop her all the time and say like, okay, but how did you get from here to here? And mm -hmm. how did you get from here to here? And so she was thankfully, you know, um, generous enough to walk me through everything from the very beginning. So the very beginning pitch was just this very sweet kind of coaching conversation that sounded um, like a conversation between friends. And so we went on this walk and she, you know, pulled out all her, her rapport and mirroring techniques on me. She sort of tried to lure me into um, just a nice, comfortable, on the same journey conversation about what I'd like to do in the future and, and um, how I'd like to transform my life if given an opportunity. And then she pulled out the hard sell and she was sort of getting me to commit to, you know, a $3,000 course. And it took me off guard. I have to say, I didn't see it coming. I thought I knew um, how that would go. And um, suffice to say, she could surprise me just about every time that we, we met. Um, but yeah, I, I was really grateful for that, but I did want to go, you know, deeper than just, you know, one person's story. And so that's why I did sort of seek out um, people from Ranieri's childhood and, you know, all the people sort of around um, the Vancouver Center and also the Albany Center to make sure I'm getting all the views because the difference in perspective between, you know, the bottom of the food chain versus the middle versus the top versus the outside is just so different and contrasting in this story. Um, there are a lot of people who, you know, see Sarah Edmondson's role even as, you know, someone who was making money and recruiting, you know, about 2000 people into this group. Mm -hmm. And so therefore, you know, somewhat complicit in, in what came afterwards. And I think she understands that and I think feels a responsibility to sort of correct that and try and get the people that she brought into the group out. So that's why you see her being such a public advocate uh, for, you know, the truth coming out in this case. Um, I just wanted to let everyone know if you're watching on YouTube or Facebook, you can use the comment feature and we'll see those comments on our end. Um, the first comment that came through is from Lainey, who she didn't do her homework and wants to know if it's fiction. Unfortunately, this is not fiction. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, this is a nonfiction story, even though it seems unbelievable. Um, but Keith Raniere is a real guy and he is now sentenced to 120 years in federal prison. And to um, go back to the the first real conversation that you had where you were caught off guard by the pitch, um, one thing that kept coming into my mind when I was reading the book, when I had just kind of put it out on my own personal Facebook page of, has anyone watched The Vow or has anyone watched Seduced? And one of my friends said, 
I watched the vow and it made me realize how stupid people are. And I, from everything that I read in your book, like I don't feel that, I don't have the opinion that they're stupid. Maybe not all of them. <laughs> um, but I don't feel like you have that, that opinion that um, these are stupid people. <laughs> No, yeah, and it really is hard to convey. Like, I credit to the VOW directors for, you know, even stitching together such, you know, a complex story in a visual format, Mm -hmm. uh, because I did have to do just a ton of homework, right? Like, on thought reform and sort of uh, the theorists that, that, are trying to work out the science behind how how people's thoughts change and how people reframe experiences in this way. Um, So yeah, I I would say that the women that came to this group, they were actually really strong-willed and determined people. And they were super idealistic. They really wanted to change the world. Some of them came from really privileged places and may have had some insecurity about that and wanted to sort of do something meaningful that would help the people around them. Um, And I think that idealism and that willingness to take actually really intense personal sort of uh, criticism, right? Like they would always be assessed for their inner deficiencies. And Mm. and this um, ability to say, okay, I'm wrong. You know, this, this person who's trying to improve my life and help me, you know, grow in a personal development type of way is right. Um, that's what got them into a position where they're being influenced and controlled by this, you know, really concentrated group of women. Um, so one of the ex partners of Keith Raniere called it the wolf pack. So you had these coaches who had been compromised already in some of the same ways, uh, but they were going to them and making sure that they stayed in line. So they couldn't go against the controls without inviting this intense sort of coaching backlash. Mm -hmm. Um, And they also, you know, sort of held things over their heads. So you had people like Daniela, for example, who came to the US from Mexico, her undocumented status in the United States was essentially used against her. So any time that she tried to go against some of the controls that were coming in, again, over a period of years, so it didn't seem like um, an intense personal control right at first, Mm -hmm. Um, but any time she sort of went against uh, the narrative or, or even tried to criticize some of the actions, it was said, you know, we brought you here, Um, you have to, essentially do what we say. So I think they consented to transforming their lives, um, but I don't think they consented to then the thought reform practices. And again, these are like military grade, um, doing the research on thought reform. um, This theorist, Robert J. Lifton, sort of identified uh, eight different criteria to create thought reform. And he did this studying, you know, what prisoners of war experienced coming out of Korea, uh, what what made these strong-willed and educated soldiers change their mind about their own home country. And Nexium, I mean, aside from the violence, they they included all eight of these thought reform criteria in, mm-hmm. in the actual classes. So it's powerful stuff and it's slippery. Like you can't quite put your finger on how it works, um, but it, yeah, it just sort of snuck in over time. And then you have these sort of strong-willed and really strategizing young women uh, essentially putting all their skills towards the benefit of this guy at the top. Um, There was a section of the book of, can concentrated social influence really change what a person thinks, feels, and experiences? You just touched on on that uh, a bit. Um, It reminded me there's a... um, a limited series podcast called um, Rabbit Hole by Kevin Roos, who's a um, New York Times contributor. Um, And it just kind of answers the question. And this is more so just YouTube algorithms that are just kind of mindlessly guiding you down this path of who knows what, (laughs) for the the sake of the the podcast, it was more like right-wing extremism. 
But this is obviously the same as that, only much more intentional. Um, so. Yeah, I'm so glad you brought that up, actually. I love that podcast, Rabbit Hole. And mm -hmm. I do think they point to a similar sort of vulnerability in our society right now, where we don't have a lot of you know, supportive friends and family around us there for us to sort of bounce off ideas and sort of test out what we're thinking about. Um, a lot of us are just more isolated than ever before. Our communities are sort of fragmented and that can create a system where you're not um, able, you're, you're more vulnerable to influence. Mm -hmm. um, so Nexium definitely engineered a system of influence that, that you had people basically breathing down each woman's neck to make sure they, they were having, they were not only doing what, um, Keith Raniere wanted, but we're even framing it in the way that he wanted. So as a good thing and as personal growth, right? Everything insidious that happened in Nexium was always framed as, you know, for the good of the cause, for the good of personal growth. Um, and as long as you have people sort of around you telling you that, reinforcing that and, and making sure you don't, you know, criticize or have outside sort of feedback, Mm -hmm. um, that that's gonna you know create that system. I mean, it is flimsy. Like you can tell that once these women got out of it and could think for themselves and could, you know, seek feedback, they did start to change their minds. You know, mm -hmm. like new information came to them and they did fall out of the spell. So it is like something that's fixable. Like we can bring our communities together. Um, we can make sure we have a wider circle of influence that, you know, we can test our ideas uh, on people who have different ways of thinking and different political beliefs. Mm -hmm. I think that's so important to have that sort of healthy debate going on. And it's something that's just sorely, sorely lacking, especially, you know, in 2021. And that's kind of serves as a good segue for a question from Daniel. Um, can I ask about the current dynamic between people still loyal to Ranieri and those who have openly broken with him? Right, sure. Um, so from what I understand, you know, all the folks who have left and have publicly criticized Nexium, they're ready to embrace, you know, the, the loyalists with open arms, no questions asked. That's sort of just how they feel. They know it happened to them. Like, where mm -hmm. they change their minds. So they know that it can happen to the folks who are still in at any time. Mm -hmm. um, I, and I do, every once in a while, I get a request from Sarah Edmondson, like, oh, you should send your Globe article to Nikki Klein. Like yeah. <laughs> she, she wants, you know, sense to sort of reach her, you know, um, especially because Sarah Edmondson was who recruited Nikki. Um, but yeah, I don't think there is open lines of communication. I think mm. from the inside, they're, they're really shutting down anyone who doesn't sort of align with their version, um, which is unfortunate, right? Because yeah. I mean, yeah, they're basically trying to put the narrative forward that the charges were false, that Sarah Edmondson's narrative is false, and that, you know, we really need to question um, all of the witnesses who testified. Um, and there, the I'll probably going to say rabbit hole about 10 more times during this, um, mm -hmm. because just as a warning to anyone who reads the book or starts watching the, the docuseries, also read the book, um, you will feel the need to go down this rabbit hole. So it's going <laughs> through, and I just like, I started searching um, the different names that, that you had brought up um, throughout the book. Um, Mark Elliott was one. Obviously, Nikki Klein is a, a very prominent part of it. So I just started like following these people <laughs> on Twitter. I'm like, and it, it just kind of baffles you when you're looking from an outside perspective. And um, I almost started looking like this didn't come up out of nowhere. Like Nexium was around for 20, 20 years or so. Um, Keith was up to a whole bunch of things for longer than that. Um, so I had started to search. There is a book coming out next week um, by Jamie Wheel, and it's called Recapture the Rapture. One of the parts of the book, like a third of the book, is ethical cult building. 
what? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I got to check this out. I so I started getting on their, their email list and I'm like, I'm just very curious, but also hesitant that I don't get sucked into whatever this might be. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's kind of fascinating. Yeah. I mean, there is just all this gray area between what is just a committed group of people trying to, you know, do charity or, you know, spread a particular spiritual belief and what then gets into a point where the control and influence tactics are unethical, potentially mm -hmm. criminal, potentially fraudulent. So, um, yeah, I think that's part of the reason actually why I, I am very sparing, I would say, with uh, the word cult, I mean, mm -hmm. even just the title, don't call it a cult, that's sort of <laughs> mostly referencing Sarah's fear at the beginning to say the word cult. But it's also um, because everybody comes uh, comes with a different level of understanding of what a cult is. Um, mm -hmm. And some, some of us have sort of preconceived notions. It's like, oh, is it just weird beliefs? Or, or is there something else sort of systemically going on? Uh, I wanted to show the coercion and the harm first and just make sure that part was kind of clear and understood uh, before drawing any kind of conclusion about what that means and what that is. Um, so yeah, I, I would be curious to know as well in the case of this other book, uh, what, what they define as with or without um, that label cult. Yeah. Um, and it was just kind of, it was interesting to me because um, the reason I found this book is there was a person in like December who had contacted me on LinkedIn and now they have like disappeared on LinkedIn, but I was able to find enough information that led me back to the, to, to this book. Um, but yeah, it was just, I have nothing more to add on that. <laughs> really, really I'm going to check here. it out. We're going to yeah. discuss it offline. <laughs> <Sounds good. laughs> um, the one thing that I wanted to, like, that just baffles me. Um, and as much as I've read into it, and as much as you described, how does Keith become Vanguard? Um, from all accounts, like, the you had interviewed, like, childhood friends of his or just people who knew him as a child and into college, um, he was kind of like a loser. <laughs> he and um, just lied, didn't have a lot of friends and the transformation, how do, how do you feel that, that that happens? I don't know if you have an answer for that. Yeah, well, he was working on it for an incredibly long time, right? So he even in the 80s seemed to be expressing this you know, interest in building something around his genius. And he did have lots of women helping him. So mm -hmm. um, by his own words, it's so interesting because he sort of tells on himself in his own legal filings, right? He's saying he has this special human behavior equation that he solved that makes everyone, you know, committed to a cause. Um, and so he's saying that he's already using that in the 80s to sort of bring women into his inner circle and making sure they're helping him sort of build a business around him, essentially. Mm -hmm. um, and so once you have people committing 110% of their entire lives to this outcome of building him up as a genius philosopher, you know, that that's what you know, built up his reputation. And that's what allowed him to sort of have this alleged uh, IQ record, right? Like they mm -hmm. did a take home test um, and he had tons of help on it. Um, and he even got the administrator to sort of restructure the scoring so that he would have this eye popping world uh, famous result. Um, the Guinness Book then retired actually that category because the scoring was um, so cooked. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you just had so many people believing in him and working for him that it just sort of snowballed. Um, that that's the only way that I can sort of describe it. He's mm -hmm. he's using the same control tactics, you know, 
it in DOS even before Nexium ever existed, right? Like he knew the deepest, darkest secrets of all the women in his inner circle. And they would therefore sort of have internalized that if they ever go against him, that that's trouble for them. They're, they're not going to want to do anything but support him 110%. And on that note, um, I forgot what it stands for now, but can you describe what NLP is? Sure. Yeah. So that's neuro linguistic programming. It's this made up field that sort of combines hypnotherapy with a bunch of theory around language. Um, so this guy, Richard Bandler, who is a real anti-science, like kind of asshole guy. <laughs> Hope I can say that on the feed. Um, <laughs> he, he basically said he invented this field because he didn't like people criticizing him or saying that he was wrong, right? And so he basically developed um, a number of uh, influence techniques, right? So if somebody, um, it, it, you basically start identifying triggers um, that will create certain emotional states and you can potentially, you know, conjure those states in other people um, sort of at will. And so that type of theory was folded all into the Nexium curriculum. Um, so you had people practicing these, these NLP techniques uh, even in the breakout groups uh, during seminars. And it's interesting because it does give someone who's trained in it shortcuts to basically make all of the sort of people involved feel a certain way, either scared or, you know, just super motivated. Um, but at the same time, it's, you know, pretty pseudoscientific, right? Like the experts I all spoke to were like, no, nah, this whole field is just based on really shaky territory. It's really not the key that's, you know, doing the most heavy lifting. It really is just the concentrated social influence. Um, because if, if we're in a group of people and everyone says the sky is blue or the sky is purple, like 10, like a 36% of people are going to go along with what, what the majority say, no matter what. So that's a huge compelling finding. Um, the experts that I talked to in writing this book sort of pointed me more towards that than mm -hmm. this NLP thing. While, while it sounds fancy, it sounds like a special magic tool. Mm -hmm. um, I think it was only, you know, a small sort of uh, fraction of, of the story and the dynamics going on. When I was putting together my notes earlier today, um, a quote from Seinfeld popped into my head from George Costanza of, it's not a lie if you believe it. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. Oh, that's so applicable. I love that. Uh, there's a couple questions that came in in relation to um, the Bronfman sisters and Sarah. Um, of What sort of money did Claire and Sarah put into Nexium? And is Sarah still a true, belie true believer? Right. So um, they put so, so much money towards the some of the first contributions were, you know, in the $2 million range just to um, build uh, developments like um, the headquarters um, and whatnot. Um, and then it sort of snowballed into, well, they got a private jet that, you know, Nancy Salzman used. They got more properties. Claire bought a farm near Albany. Um, they got a, you know, um, a number of properties that they started renting out and then they switched their money management to using one of the Nexium uh, inner circle as a financial planner. And under that guidance, they started um, just investing tons of money into new foundations uh, that were Nexium headed and uh, as well his financial interests. So he had this idea that he was going to beat the commodities market. Mm -hmm. And uh, Claire and Sarah, I think, contributed over 150 million just into, um, or it might be 65 million in the failed commodities 
scheme uh, and, and 150 million overall over the period of maybe six years uh, in the early 2000s. So mm -hmm. just incredible um, amounts of money being put into this. Uh, but they weren't the only ones. There were other heiresses that were sort of funding various initiatives. So it was definitely a money suck. Yeah. There was a question that pops up earlier and I didn't want to forget about it um, from Karen. As a writer of a true crime book, are there other true crime books you admire? Well, definitely for writing this one, um, I obviously loved Going Clear. I read it a couple times and, and found new sort of nuggets in it every time. Um, I would also say the book Savage Appetites by Rachel Monroe is a really interesting sort of meta analysis of, of all the roles uh, that there are, especially for women in true crime, right? So some people identify with the victim or the advocate or the killer. Um, and it's interesting to see how that sort of falls along sort of these gendered lines. Um, so I definitely recommend checking that one out. It, it helped me um, think about so many things before they even happened, like um, even just the fan base that developed sort of like in the wake of the vow, she mm -hmm. sort of addresses how, how that happens, how everyone can think they know a case, even though they're just, you know, they're on Reddit or in some forum, just getting really obsessed. Um, how is it that they feel an ownership or that they know these people? Um, so just, yeah, super fascinating uh, book. I'm gonna have to pick that one up. Um, it reminded me like Making a Murderer, um, The Staircase, uh, people really get get in, get involved in those. I did myself. Um. Yeah, I, I understand <laughs> it. Like I also got super obsessed, you know, like, and I needed, you know, there's just this need to understand. So I do get it to an extent, but when, yeah, people on Twitter are just like, yeah, I don't know. Sometimes it's a false sense of knowledge and, and even knowing otherwise, it just seems so compelling to people. I don't know yet what you do with that. Um, there's a question that just popped in and um, it'll also be a good segue into, um, you recently wrote about why you didn't use the phrase sex cults um, in, in regards to Nexium. Um, the question is, were some of the followers involved with submitting to them in intimately? Yes, yeah, so definitely there was, um, sort of a system of getting women uh, in sexual relationships with Keith. And a lot of them were facilitated by Pam K. Fritz. So before 2016, when she died, she was basically, you know, bringing women in as sort of chosen ones to um, have these secret relations with Keith Raniere. Uh, that's how she facilitated a relationship with. So there's Nancy Salt, Salzman's daughter, Lauren Salzman, was sort of swept into it that way. Um, and then you had some of the Mexican sisters um, who whose family name is protected by court order. Um, you had the eldest sister also being sort of groomed and facilitated into a relationship that way. Um, that's not to say I don't consider it a sex cult, um, because I, I think you can use that as a shorthand and readers do understand it. Mm -hmm. um, but I do think it's uh, an oversimplified uh, sense of the story. It can give this impression that maybe women chose to join it for sex. Um, mm -hmm. And that's just absolutely not the case. Nobody joined a sex cult. Uh, nobody like thought that it was even about sex right? They thought it was about personal growth. And that's why they submitted this really damaging material called collateral, sometimes including false accusations, uh, accusing their parents of uh, sexual uh, molestation. So, so yeah, uh, I don't um, want to discourage anybody from using sex cult as a short mm -hmm. form, but I sort of as a practice just wanted to See if I could describe it all, 
all the other elements of it too, right? Because that's only just one facet. They were also controlled in the way they ate and slept and who they could interact with. They There were many people they couldn't have sex with, right? So there was a lot of direction like, you know, never contact this ex, you know, like you have to be celibate for X amount of time, right? So mm-hmm. it was just a lack of autonomy across the board. Uh, that was really what characterized this case. And so to say it's a sex cult, you know, yeah, sometimes you would see in like the New York Post or, you know, one of the more tabloidy um, outlets, it described as like a sexual feeding frenzy. And that just Mm -hmm. isn't what was happening. It just doesn't make sense to the women who were part of it. And I kept hearing that too, you know, from the women themselves and and the lawyer uh, that represents a lot of them. So, yeah, I think what they say happened to them was they were extorted, um, they were blackmailed, they, they, you know, they were part of a fraudulent scheme that did include, you know, sexual violation. Mm. Um, There's a question that came in from um, Bess, and it's something that I kind of thought of when I was reading your book and then the the other book that, that we can talk about later. Um, in spite of obvious harm that the inner circle caused, did you see any possible good coming from Nexium? Yeah, that's an interesting one. I feel like um, definitely some of the folks who were part of this group do think it brought people out of their, you know, limiting patterns. I think mm-hmm. on an individual level, sure, there were women who got over um, fear of auditions, a shyness, you know, sort of basic, um, yeah, personal characteristics that they wanted to transform. Mm -hmm. The the whole idea that everything we think and believe is kind of flexible and you can transform yourself, um, just those ideas alone and, and, and the fact that you had a community of people sort of reinforcing it did help some people, but, I would just have to attribute that to the community itself and the care that these women had for each other, more so than the special Keith Raniere rational inquiry technology. Mm -hmm. Um, I just think you had people who really did put in effort and care into helping people and coaching people. And so inevitably, yeah, there was some personal growth to be had. but to say, you know, therefore, you know, there's no reason to criticize this. I mean, yeah, obviously there were problems uh, that needed to be dealt with in this case. And I don't know if we had addressed it during this, but a lot of the people involved, not everyone, but they were in the acting community. So just yeah. by, by, by the sake of networking, there are is going there is going to be uh, some positive aspects of getting to know the right people, um, but the totally. cost of analysis kind of loses out on that one. <laughs> that's the uh, that's the thing. That's why a lot of women join. So yeah, later in the book, um, I talked to Maya, um, and so her her story sort of starts in part three, and she mm. thought joining this group was like being invited to an Oscar party. Right. Mm -hmm. You had people with huge names who had very long IMDb pages in Mm -hmm. the same room chatting and and being really down to earth. And so that was super appealing. And it did help some people. They did help each other, you know, sort of get roles. Um, Even in DOS, Alison Mack was um, trying to help her slaves get you know, interviews with different agencies or try out for theater productions in New York. So there was this um, seductive networking thing that was real to people. You know, they did think that was a draw and they weren't being duped on that front necessarily. It just, yeah, came with just so, so much baggage. Yeah. Um, One question, Active Media has put in a lot of questions and I, Can't hit them all, but one of the ones is, how many children does Keith R. have? Right, so he has two that we know about. So there's Galen, that's Kristen Keith's uh, son, 
and they escaped from the Nexium community in 2014. And then there's Kamar, so that's his do uh, son, sorry, with Mariana, uh, who is from all accounts still loyal to Ranieri, even mm -hmm. though all of her siblings and her mother have, you know, spoken in court against this group. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the two we know of. There are other rumors about others, but I, I really couldn't verify them. Um, so I'll stick to two. Okay. Um, and I wanted to acknowledge um, Bess, who asked the earlier question, said that there were many normal everyday members. Um, she had attended a handful of V weeks. The dynamic was constantly changing in one thing one year, other than the next one thing didn't change. Keith and Nancy found themselves at the center. So thank you, Bess, for uh, joining the conversation. Yes, thank you for joining. I love to hear from anyone who went to a V week. Um, definitely, it seemed like the vibe at a V week was just like summer camp for adults, right? Mm -hmm. So people involved themselves in, you know, theater or a triathlon. Um, there definitely didn't seem to be anything sinister going on. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and so you did have a very regular person, how could anything strange be going on sort of reinforcement, right? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the thing. A group like this always has layers, right? So the out outside layer looks pretty normal, looks um, like it could be anyone, like you or me. And then once you get into the sort of center of it where the controls are stronger and the coercion is more intense, that's when you have, you know, more unbelievable actions and circumstances. Mm -hmm. um, and just to kind of swing a little bit, um, we're in, we're far from Albany, um, but in New York state, um, there were some local connections that I didn't piece together until I was reading your book. Um, Frank Parlato is one of the main ones. I'm originally from Buffalo. Uh, we're an hour and a half from Buffalo in our, our right. school location. Um, Frank, uh, I never met him, but I know people that, that know him. He comes with some baggage, um, but he took over Art Voice, which I used to do a lot of PR work for like film festivals in, in, in the Buffalo area. Oh, that's funny. Um, and our voice was one of the main, our big supporters until Frank took it over, mm -hmm. um, and then it and then it, it changed a little bit. And I recall a um, a blogger um, out of the Buffalo area that I admire a lot. In like 2015, I in my deep dive of all things Nexium after reading your book, um, was really bashing Frank of oh Albany sex cult yada yada yada. Frank's doesn't know what he's talking about. Turns out he did know what he was talking about. <laughs> yeah. um, but did you, because you had mentioned Frank a couple times in the book, did you have a chance to speak, to interview him directly? Oh yeah, yeah. We spoke many times over the years. He sort of was part of the effort to get this story, get attention on this story, right? So in October, mm -hmm. 2017, he and I were in touch quite a lot um, because I mean, they were still trying to get authorities to act. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it, that's the thing. Everything sort of evolves and changes over time. And then I, we sort of fell out of contact for a while. Uh, but finally, I did interview him about sort of his involvement because he was um, there doing PR for Nexium back in 2007. And then he took it upon himself to sort of sort out a uh, real estate deal situation with the Bronfmans. And um, there were just these mentions in depositions that he had done all these sort of weird and shady things. So I sort of had to bring them up and sort of get his take on things because he had sort of gone um, and let the developer believe he was working for the Bronfmans. He claims he didn't say it himself. Uh, he did hire to sort of actors to pose as a lawyer and a bodyguard. Um, so maybe those actors were the ones who gave them that impression. Um, but yeah, so I, I had to confront him sort of on his role in the story and as well his sort of role getting the story, the real story to the media. 
Um, and even though the way he describes things on his site is pretty different, I think, from what I would uh, describe it as, um, I, I do think, yeah, it's an important sort of part of the story. You can't ignore it. Um, he's got his own, yeah, personality. He's got his own agenda in many cases. Um, but I think that is pretty apparent. Like you can kind of read it as it presents itself, if that makes sense. Yes. No, I think you did a very fair analysis of that situation <laughs> of not not putting any real opinion on it of this is what this is what we've heard. <laughs> um, yeah. Towards yeah. the <laughs> towards the end of the the book, and it's something um, especially with the the Frank connection, and then making the mistake of following people on Twitter. I started to get paranoid <laughs> leading up to this event. Oh dear! <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> that's okay. I brought it on myself. Um, you talk about some of the um, I don't know if paranoia is the word that you would use, or if you, if you use that one, but the uncomfortableness that you had felt once you got further along in, in investigating the story. Yeah, so, I mean, early on, too, people who had left Nexium started telling me about the quote-unquote flying monkeys. Um, so this mm -hmm. was um, seemingly what happened to people when they left Nexium or criticized. They would suddenly get workplace complaints. They would potentially be followed by private investigators. Um, some of them had fictitious change of address forms filled out for them, or some even had just their phone wires call, uh, cut. Uh, so all these sort of weird, spooky things would start happening to people, especially people who left and were critical mm -hmm. uh, in the media or, or just publicly on their own. So when I started reporting this story, I uh, at first thought, you know, I'm just one of hundreds of reporters covering the story. How could um, anybody possibly, you know, pick me out of the crowd to sort of um, follow or, or harass? Um, but I mean, as the months sort of turned to years, it did start to weigh on me. And I, I did start to wonder um, what the motivations for certain people who came forward to me were, you know, if they really were who they said they were. Um, and yeah, just really trying to keep an open mind to the fact that something um, could go sideways at any time. Um, it's not a great place to live in your brain. Like, yeah. I don't recommend it. Um, but yeah, I, I do sort of describe what that felt like uh, sort of leading up to the trial um, and and some of the thinking I was doing. Unfortunately, it's just unprovable, right? So you're just left with your, yeah, essentially paranoia, um, <laughs> your skepticism, and it doesn't feel great. <laughs> Spoiler alert. Yeah. <laughs> um, there was a question that I had. And, oh, no, it's gone. Um, <laughs> so the end of the book, um, you wrote a letter to, to Keith um, that asked a lot of questions. Have you heard back from that letter? Alas, I have not. Yeah, so I mailed that um, last June, I think, 2019, mm -hmm. sort of after the trial, after the conviction. Uh, and I, I mean... I knew what his public statements usually were like. They were usually, you know, deflections. They were usually about how noble everything was. Um, but there was still questions remaining to me in terms of, like, did he think he was duping or did he believe his own hype, you know? Like, so mm -hmm. what is his belief? Does he think that women should have trusted him with everything in their life, including their medical decisions. You know, does he really think that he didn't do anything wrong when he had a sexual relationship with a 15 year old? You know, like, mm -hmm. does he believe his own hype is essentially the kind of question that I couldn't get from anyone except him. Mm -hmm. um, so I did mail it to him while he was at the MDC in Brooklyn. Uh, he's since been relocated and he did since uh, 
change lawyers. So I sent it again to his new lawyers. Uh, that was probably back in February and still haven't heard back, but I am fully committed to, you know, reporting on it if I ever do. So if, if, uh, if you're out there, Keith, <laughs> you can still send those messages. I will still absolutely publish something might not be in a book, but, um, yeah, I just think that does still remain a question mark. It'll be a good reason to do a follow-up second edition. <laughs> a second edition, <laughs> sure. A new prologue or something yeah. like that. Um, oh, the the, um, the question kind of came back to me, and somebody asked a similar question of, what do you make of Nikki Klein and kind of an overall um, all-encompassing the... I know you're looking forward to Nexium being in your rear view mirror. You've got a <laughs> while to show people that need to be sentenced. Um, but when there's people like Nikki Klein, um, Mark Elliott had announced that he's going to be doing a new like speaking tour. Um, right. It almost seems like a, a revival uh, mm -hmm. of Nexium and possibly not the sex cult <laughs> aspect of it, hopefully. Um, but what what are your thoughts? Like, are you still following the the people that are the true believers in in Nexium? Yeah. So Nikki Klein specifically is a super interesting character because she did grow up just around here, and I know I'm pretty tight with some of her high school friends, right? Mm -hmm. And so I do feel like I understand where she's coming from in some ways. Um, definitely, I think that. Staying loyal is this path of least least resistance for her. So she's mm -hmm. committed so much of her time and her, you know, purpose and meaning in life to this this project, this group. And for her to back off of that, she needs to think about, yeah, just sort of losing all the important relationships, you know, that she's made within the group. Um, and she would have to sort of admit that she was wrong. And I just think that that isn't always a place you can come to right away. Like even Sarah Edmondson said that part took her months and months, right? Like it wasn't right away, right after the brand. It was two months later in, in May where they finally started reaching out to um, authorities. She wasn't sure if she was, you know, if anything bad had even happened to her, you know, like she still had to kind of think that over and I think that sort of thinking um, takes a while, you know, it, it needs to be planted as a seed and then that needs to sort of grow and then it needs to be tested against other people. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I, I would say in terms of uh, the true believers, I, I definitely think they are still entitled to their beliefs, right? Like I do try to separate belief and action, you know, like, there, there were various harms that happened in this group and they've, some of them anyway, have been dealt with in a court of law. And that doesn't change, you know, the, their beliefs don't change the legal process and, and what the facts are. Um, but yeah, it is pretty mind bending to know that they do still see empowerment in this group that has been, you know, proven in various ways. Uh, to be so harmful. Um, but I sort of, I think I did this at the launch as well. I compare it to um, gay conversion therapy. Mm -hmm. So this is something, obviously something society has decided is wrong and against, you know, basic human rights that, you know, people should be able to, you know, maintain their sexual identity. Um, but the people who go through it some of them, a smaller percentage, do come out of it saying, I'm ex-gay, I don't have those feelings anymore, mm -hmm. and I'm so happy that it happened to me, you know? And just because somebody goes through that, that gauntlet and comes out the other end and says, you know, okay, I'm happy this happened to me, doesn't mean um, we can't sort of look at what's happening, see the harms in it, and sort of, um, yeah, create a system of accountability for it. So it's sort of like that, I would say, it. her believing in the group doesn't change the facts of this story and the facts of this case. Um, but 
but it does make it more interesting because it's so different and it just doesn't seem to fit together. Yeah. Um, but that's, that's just what made it such an interesting kind of problem to solve, right? Like you just kind of go back and forth and you're like, how, you know, how can one person from this perspective see empowerment and how can this other person be like, I was extorted and trafficked, you know? Um, it, Frankly, still, yeah, there's still many question marks there, but I hope I've laid it out in a way where people can make those decisions for themselves of, of what went on. Mm -hmm. There was one question, um, there's two questions that we'll get into, our, our hour is winding down. Um, one that popped up a few times, are the Bronfman sisters still all in on, on next right. year? Sorry, yes, this, I forgot to answer that when you asked it the first time. Yeah. Uh, Claire is still um, not denouncing Keith Raniere. So she yeah. is uh, loyal to him. She will not say a bad word about him. And mm -hmm. I think this did hurt her uh, at her sentencing. So the judge gave her three times the uh, guideline. Uh, so almost seven years uh, of prison time uh, because of it. Um, leading up to that sentencing, her sister, Sarah, said essentially that she had denounced Keith. She had let, written a letter in defense of her sister mm -hmm. saying basically the reasons why she was so idealistic and in, in sticking to it. Um, it sort of presented this, you know, um, just like story of why Claire is loyal and why she was duped. Mm -hmm. um, so that seems to be an admission that she no longer is um, loyal. Um, and it makes sense because she had left the country. She had been far away from the group. A as part of uh, the investigation, there were orders not to um, have open communication within the group. So that did sort of stop the influence system for a lot of people. Um, so yeah, that's what I know about where they're at. Uh, certainly, I'm sure uh, Claire's lawyers would prefer her to not be loyal, but she just can't do it. She she believes in Keith Raniere to this day. Well, with that, there's still questions popping in, but from what I saw, a lot of them can be answered by picking up. <laughs> uh, I want to thank everyone for watching. Thanks, Sarah, for um, spending the time with us. Pick up Don't Call It a Cult. We have it in store at Off the Beaten Path Bookstore. Um, it's available at obpbooks.com. Also, um, two more promotions. This coming Saturday is Independent Bookstore Day. Um, we have exclusive items that are only available at indie bookstores. If you're not from the Lakewood area, please go to your local independent bookstore. Um, if they don't have this book, tell them to get it. Um, our next event is going to be um, next Wednesday at 7 p.m. with Stacy Flood who wrote The Salt Fields. Um, the Salt Fields is a story that is set um, in the 1940s in South Carolina um, with an African-American individual who has a lot of baggage. He heads on a train to go up north um, and it's beautifully told, great story. Um, pick it up. Um, thanks again, Sarah. Was there anything else that you wanted to add before we close out? No, that's everything. Thanks, Bob, for having me. This was really fun. Uh, I feel like we could have done another two hours. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> Thank you so much.